Before there were MP3 players, before there were like programs to slow things down, how c c talk us through like the process of you learning music at that time? Like you know, how did how did you go about learning music and, and, and uh, the stuff that you wanted to learn? Well, all I'm saying is you just mentioned I haven't figured out how to operate that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the, the the best way to describe that, and I've done a lot of thinking lately about it. Because when I did get a chance to teach uh, where jazz studies was a major emphasis, was uh, when I first started at uh, the New Orleans Central Creative Arts. And the first thing that came to me, and this was like 74, 1974, the first thing that came to me I realized that I didn't have any idea how I learned to play this music. <laughs> now, what I mean by that, <clears throat> I had a real good piano teacher early in my life, which was back in the 50s. And I was able to retain whatever was necessary to actually sit down at the piano and practice and understand how to do that. But in 74, when I started at the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts, when I say I didn't have any idea how I learned the music, what I mean is that nothing was codified. I could not go to a music store and say, okay, I want to get the book one, jazz, you know, and I got to get the second level, okay, book two, jazz. <laughs> You know, there was none of that. And when it came to feeders, you know, there were some good feeder schools if you were going into the marching band. And maybe if you were fortunate enough to have a uh, band director, and you know, in this area, anybody that's from here, uh, like Walter Harris and Kennedy or his cousin uh, at McDonald's 35. These guys were master bandsmen and had good marching band. They also had good concert band. But after that, there was nothing. You didn't, there was no jazz, jazz study. And if there was any attitude at all in the academic community, it was a negative one. There was nothing positive about it at all. So over a period of time, Starting from 1974, I started to piecemeal information that allowed me to do a certain amount of codification of actually how I learned how to do what I, what I subsequently did. And uh, the irony of that <clears throat> is that when I came here, in uh, 89, I think. Is that what 89? 89. In 89. I came with my mentor, Harold Batiste. Now, Harold had a huge amount to do with my learning of music. Because he was uh, maybe two or three years ahead of me. Which more is like a time thing. It had nothing to do with me. But he was uh, one who was very strong composition. He wrote a lot of 
a lot of pieces. And uh, it helped. Uh, the first time I had a, uh, a lesson and learned how to read concert was at Village University in my freshman year. And Harold just went to the backboard and said, this is how you do it. Otherwise than that, I could sit at the piano and voice and stuff and move around and play a solo I heard on the record, but I didn't really understand nothing about that. You know, somebody said, look, man, play a C major seven cards. And I said, Ooh. You know, what, what is that? You know. But for the most part, uh, there's some things that I'm working on right now in a pedagogical sense. And uh, I hope to, to finish, you know, some things for uh, beginning types of piano. But uh, the one thing that I noticed, and the one thing that I wanted to, to maintain was the thing that I'm working on. You have to read it. But what you are reading with some of these little things, they're all little pieces. They're just blues. You know, little pieces, 12 measures of blue. But you do have to read it. And, but in terms of how we learn how to play, <coughs> it was primarily on a bandstand. You know, I heard a, an interview with Lil Harvey, who was Liz Armstrong. Uh, wife, she had gone to Oberlin and studied music and came to New Orleans and she was working with King Oliver's band and she described in this interview what it was like when she joined the band. Now the way she described it is hard to really get a good picture of that. So she said that when they got ready to play it, they would just stomp and take off. Now, that is what they did. They were still doing that, you know, even when I was coming along. Uh, but not nearly as much. See, like going back in the early years, of the, the, the trad musicians, when they were on the bandstand, the leader was thinking of a song to play between songs. That they, they finish one and they sit around and talk in the web. Then the leader would say, which is like attention, just those two. And after that, it would just, it would just go and take off. Now, the thing of, you know, counting tempos off, they didn't count tempos off. You were supposed to know that. Now, how you were supposed to know it, I don't know. <laughs> you were supposed to know that. You know. Uh, I only played with one musician we used to do that. His name was Teddy Ride. He's a trumpet player. And when I think about Teddy, Teddy was the best prepared musician on a gig that I had ever played with. And what, this is what I mean. We were working at a club on Bourbon Street uh, called Storyville. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Crazy Shirley's. The band was Bob French's band, Storyville Jazz Band. And when Teddy Riley came to work, the, the trumpet player, he had a stand on the stand. He had a cup mute, a helmet on mute. He had a tin hat, which is like Mohawk sound and straight new. That's the only one that I remember right off hand. But he was well prepared. 
And in the process over the years, there's a lot of a lot of you younger guys never got the, the, the instructions for that. But primarily, unless you were actually playing music that required that, then there would be no need for you to have one. You see? But when it comes to uh, you know, what Steve was talking about, uh, all of the electronic stuff, uh, that had little or no influence on what I was able to play. Sometime in the 70s, when uh, here in New Orleans, and actually not only in New Orleans, but in a lot of other places, the concept of the jazz band was kind of, I don't even know how to describe it. I mean, everything was moving electronically. You know, in the 1970s, Miles Davis recorded an album called Bridges Brook, which is all electronic stuff. So I decided, well, I guess I'm going to have to join this because uh, you know, that's the way it's going. So I bought an RMI. And you know what an RMI? You know, Rocky Mountain Instrument, but it's an electric piano, not the, the AAT. I had an RMI, I had the fuzz tone, the wah wah, the apoplex, all that. <laughs> and eventually, I got rid of the RMI and I bought a Rhodes, 73 key at the time. And um, I played that uh, for, I don't, I don't remember how long, but I played that. And, I think what made me make the decision to walk away from that, uh, there's things, these jobs through the Musicians Union, they call them green sheet jobs. Because the, the, the sheet that they give you to sign uh, to get the money is green. And uh, I played a total of 45 elementary schools. Because all of these these jobs are all like for nonprofit uh, in terms of way the way you play. And I had this rose and I had a guitar speaker. And I used to put the rose on top of this guitar speaker which is probably about that high, which means I could stand up and play. And I did all of those, and they were all elementary school. So usually it was difficult because a lot of the elementary schools here at the time, uh, the auditorium was on the second floor. And the elementary school kids are not that big. <laughs> you know, like if I was at high school, you know, I'd be a football player or something. Come help me carry the stuff there. Well, it was a struggle a lot of times to actually get that up there. But I used to do it. And I didn't have a group. It was just me and the Rose and the kids. And after I played the last job of those 45 schools, I told my wife, I said, see this thing? I'm selling it. If I never did another job, like <laughs> this was it for me. I'm through. <laughs> and by this time, it was like, oh, like in the early 80s. Uh, <clears throat> but for the most part, just, <clears throat> just over a period of time, I would add bits of things and information trying to still codify how to present jazz in a way that was sequenced. Because if you teach it in the school situation, you have to sequence the material 
and have the logic of all of that so it can be understood. And uh, I started <coughs> in graduate school in 1974. And my primary focus then was to do a thesis on the development of the rhythm section. Well, I never managed to do that. Uh, what I wanted to do was to get somebody from their communication department at Loyola who needed a project and actually had them to film what it is that I was talking about doing. Like film the, the drummers playing with different techniques and the instrumentalists. But I didn't have any money. So by the time I was able to put people in place, <laughs> the guy <I> graduated and <laughs> went away. But I still work towards doing a thesis based upon the development of a rhythm section. Now, my, the problem that I ran into, well, it took me forever to get out of school. First of all, nobody on the committee really knew anything about that. So what I would have to do was write it up and turn it into a committee. And maybe two weeks might go by because they had to circulate it. And then I'd get it back and make whatever corrections that they suggested. Well, the problem that I was running into, I had started teaching at the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts. And I was learning things pedagogically day by day. And by the time I would get the features back, everything that I wrote the first time when I handed it in had changed based on the stuff that I was learning day by day. And that went on for some years until, <laughs> until finally Joe Amy had told me one day he said, look, don't change nothing. Go on, just turn it in. Get your degree and get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, because basically that's what I was doing. Every time I learned anything that was slightly different, I would inject it into the thesis that I was working on. And uh, by '86, I think it was, uh, I got the opportunity to go to Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond. There was a program there, but it was it was a, a kind of a standard uh, jazz studies program. Uh, I won't go into the details about the chairman and what he was doing, but the last job he had at Georgia State, they gave him a half hour to play out of the desk. <laughs> 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 you know, so I don't know. <laughs> But for the most part, I only stayed there for three years. I didn't really get a chance to learn some of the things I was interested in trying to do. Because there was a difference between teaching the high school students at know. Now, I have to make uh, a specific point. Teaching high school students and notice. The difference is this. The students who went, who came to the Northern Cemetery in Rock, they did so with their electives. See, when you're in high school, there's so many electives that you have. You know, so it wasn't an after-school program. There were five disciplines, theater, dance, visual and instrumental music, visual arts, and creative writing. And the students who came using their electives would choose the, of the disciplines. You know, there was no way to take more than one of those. So uh, it was a three-person faculty. 
a vocal teacher whose specialty was primarily classical music. Um, instrumental, also with classical music, and mine was instrumental with jazz. But we functioned as a unit in a way which there wasn't really that much separation. For example, I was teaching sightseeing and theater training to everybody. So it wasn't a jazz thing over here, classical over there. You know, the emphasis would be dependent upon the interest of the student. And wherever your interest was, that was the level that you could function with. And uh, by the time I got to teaching at Virginia Commonwealth in the university, the students who came in at that level had primarily made up their mind. You know, you, you get to that level. <clears throat> so some of the things that you could try in the high school experimentally, you couldn't do that at, the, at that university because everything is about how many hours you got, what the credits are, you know, how close are you to graduation, and all of those kinds of things. You know, I remember one situation we were going into the Virginia Commonwealth uh, jazz band, and the jazz band used to go up Highway 95, and all along Highway 95, it was like these little, these little towns. There's some very, very good schools in Virginia. Well financed, the whole thing. But there was very, very, very few students interested in that. Most of the kids that we ran into in the bands, they were uh, going into engineering or going into medicine. So there's this piano player in the Virginia Commonwealth Band. And he was a kind of an older student, not the traditional, you know, 1920. Uh, he's a little older. And we would sit on the bus and talk about what he was planning on doing. Uh, and he was saying how he was really getting serious and he wanted to settle in and really work at being a good player. So we went out to Philadelphia, and there's a, a school for performing arts in Philadelphia. And there were two students at the time. Uh, who we met as a part of, you know, the recruitment. Uh, Joey DeFrancesco and Chris McBride. <laughs> and they had an impromptu jam session. You know, one of the two guys from the band, we had uh, sort of set in. Now, you have to picture this. It was sort of like an upright piano. Yeah. And there was a two in there. Chris played the bass. Joey was playing piano, uh, not organ in this game. And like, they were flying through giant steps laughing and talking at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> well, the little piano player left the school after we got there. I don't know what the guy did, but he just quit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and I think I could emphasize, I mean, he wasn't somebody that I knew really, really well, but in terms of what our conversation was, what he was saying that he wanted to do, you know, when he saw those two, then you, you said, well, okay, if this is what's coming out of high school now, you know, this is what the competition is. But basically, um, over a long period of time, I was just steady, slowly but surely putting things together to present in a way of, uh, of pedagogical approach to jazz study. When I came here in my first year, we had some real good students here. 
and the requirements was that they had to take a class, a keyboard class. And the gentleman who was teaching the keyboard class, he never went any further than the track. So, uh, and you know, the class was a requirement. So uh, I don't think you didn't know this guy. Yeah. Um, now I knew that, you know, Bryce Winston, Jeremy Davenport, all of these people, I said, man, they're not going to go to this class. Right. So I started a keyboard class on my own. And uh, everybody came in and like took that instead of what this, this other guy was doing. And um, it, was, it was another situation where I had to figure out how am I going to do this. And I worked out a system where there were a series of uh, two, five, one cards and the voices so that the overall understanding came from key to key. Because I did 251 in each key. And then we had, um, I was never a big fan of the real book. But one of the things that I found about the real book, it was consistent. Whether it was bad, it was consistently bad. <laughs> and wherever the melody was passable, it was consistent, consistent in that. Now, if you don't use the real book, uh, I don't know, to, some of the things have changed now. You know, you know, any of you know about the real book? Yeah. <laughs> you know how it came to be? It was like a legal copy, right? Huh? It was like a legal, it was like a legal book like, that they published without like consigning artists. Yeah, they went to jail. Yeah. <laughs> they were just some, some bored students <laughs> transcribing and, and ended up with a book of these two and the car changed and then they started selling uh, I know I bought my share and students did too we were like no you know there is a convenience about it <clears throat> but now I think it's much easier at least from my point of view, to teach from the the uh, the songwriter's book, like you can get the complete words of George Gershwin. Uh, I think Warner Brothers, I think, but Warner Brothers publishes just about everything that you would need in in a way of standards. You see, uh, but for the most part. The only thing I ever wanted to know if a student was using, was playing a, uh, a song with no music at all. I just wanted to know, what is your reference? Because if you say, well, I'm playing uh, Foggy Day in London Town, okay, well, who wrote that? What is your reference? Did you get it out of the real book? Because I would find out a lot of times, see, real books pay little or no attention to verse. So consequently, uh, if I'm going to teach in reference, I'll give you an example when I talk about reference. I had a student in the studio, and we were working on uh, summertime. And I asked the student, I said, have you ever heard the original version of Summertime? He says, oh yeah, man. You know, I got Miles' record. <laughs> and I said, oh, oh. I said, do you know that this piece was an aria from a musical that was called Borgy and Beth? Did you know that? Now, that was a lesson for me also. So what I did, 
I got, I think it was two, maybe three, cassettes, because I had had a recording of Morris Winters and Camilla Williams, uh, who had recorded the complete album. And I just put it on cassette, took it in the library, put it on reserve. So from then on, if we working on summertime, you go up there and listen to that. And the whole idea, and, and there also there was always some attitudes about jazz studies. You know that old expression is close enough for jazz? <laughs> yeah, well, it was a lot of that. <laughs> it's all a lot of that. And I'm sure there's probably still a lot of that. But for the most part, I like the references to be as close to, uh, I'm talking about standards, really, uh, to whatever the composer was writing. If you're doing a Gershwin thing, get the, the books. If you're doing um, Cold Porter, because you can get that in a whole book of Cold Porter songs. And in it, you will find the verse as well as the melody. Now, the chords, the way that they put them in there, might not be to your liking, but that's all right. Once you get the melody down and understand the verse, then see, we can deal with the chord change. But the whole process involving uh, jazz studies is still in a state of evolution. Right now, it's in a state of evolution. I'm tired of talking. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have a follow-up question, because you kind of you piqued my interest with that. That thesis you were writing on the rhythm section, you know, and uh, can you remember any of the thoughts you had about what you were writing at that time about the rhythm section and what you think is important about the function? Well, not a whole lot. Some, I'm sure, <coughs> used eventually. But I do remember <coughs> there's a copy at Loyola now. And um, I do remember oh, after a certain amount of time it passed by. You know, and I had had a copy. I don't even think I had a copy now. I had a copy and I started to look through it, and my first impression was, man, this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, it is what it is. You know, somebody trying to piece together something and put it in an academic format. And the, the major part of all of that was theoretical, you know? And now this is what I mean by theoretical. There was a book that I used when I was teaching sightseeing in Trump. And uh, it had been used in graduate program at Loyola. And I, I can't, it had one of those titles that was very academic, so I, I can't remember the exact title. But it was divided up <clears throat> into the front section of the book, it was all rhythms. There were two stages, there was a rhythm at the top and a rhythm beneath that. But they complemented each other. And we were, the way that the teacher, uh, Dr. McCarty was teaching, we had to conduct with the right hand, tap the rhythm with the left hand, and then read the rhythms top. Whoever was at the top, when it came to the end, it would flip, and they would go to the bottom, and likewise to the top. And the division of the beats were like, one would be sustained if it was a whole note. If it was two half notes, it would be one, three, but you would sustain that. All quarter note, one, two, three, four. When those were subdivided, it was one take, two take, three take, four take. 
If it was subdivided further to 16 notes, they were all top. So you were doing one tentative, two tentative, three tentative, four tentative, like that. And like, you know, with the conducting, you know, and the whole thing. Now, it was uh, somewhere near the middle of the book was the, 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 uh, the melodies were introduced. Same thing, top and bottom, two stage. So then you would read the melody, and then when you got to the end, you would flip and read the melody at the top, and the one at the bottom, read that. So this is basically uh, the way that we were being taught in graduate school at Loyola. I used it at Nova for, oh man, let's see. Well, until I left, which was probably 12 years. And uh, I lost track of it. Because, you know, I left Nova, then went up to Jenny Commonwealth, went there, then came here. And I wanted to use it again. So I went back over to Loyola. And people on the faculty say, well, we couldn't use that. That was too hard. <laughs> they said, it was too hard. How was it too hard? You know, I said, man, I was teaching high school kids with that. So I don't know. A lot of times, uh, you don't ever know <laughs> what's going on. But at any rate, um, if you ever want to look at that thing, you might have to go over to Loyola. Yeah, I, had, I, did, I did have one, yeah. but I don't, I don't know what happened to it. Yeah. Maybe a lot of our students in this room will be uh, secondary level teachers as well as going out and performing and inventing their lives that way, being entrepre entrepreneurs in music or whatever. But how can you get away from the bureaucracy in order to teach what you're saying? You don't. <laughs> See, the, the bureaucracy, look, there was a statement made recently that uh, the President of the United States has got this push on education and the race to the top and there's billions of dollars at stake. And you think he can get away from the bureaucracy? No way. There's no way to get away from it. You know? Uh, now, I wish there was a, a, a one-size-fits-all concept. But one of the things that the principal at Nova used to say to us, and he, he also lived it, he didn't just, just say that, it is much easier to get forgiveness than permission. <laughs> yes, that's true. I mean, you, I don't know what, uh, I'm curious. Any of you ever heard anything about that school? No. Not the one on the riverfront, the one before that. What did you hear? I mean, when I talk to people, they, I talk to them. They pretty much compared the old, the way they used to talk, teach it, like jazz at the old compared to what they do now, as far as like the the actual run of it. I, I know what that you think about that. Are there like two practice rooms that people were fighting over? Mm -hmm. Are there were only two practice rooms that everybody was fighting over who could practice? Who was the what? There were only two <laughs> practice rooms that everybody was fighting over. No, we had more practice rooms. <laughs> uh, I don't remember them fighting over but we did have more. We had those wanger, pulled them, and they put them in the basement. So we had, you know, we definitely had more than two. Not much. One, let's see, one. It's probably ten. It's probably, you know, maybe three. Or <laughs> 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 two. <laughs> and it depends on the instrument that you were playing. Like there's a flute player, I don't know I started playing in the there. As you come in the building, there was a space that used to be a drum closet. And Kemp would go right into the drum closet and stay there and practice. And 
about a year after I got there, this trumpet player, this kid that I knew named Winston, he was going to Del Salle, and he would walk from Del Salle to Nova, which wasn't that far, and go right into the practice room where Kent was, and they'd stay right in that practice room, which was really an old pro class. So, I mean, you know, you make do with whatever you had. There was a new school in Dallas, Texas, a uh, public school devoted to the arts, sort of like North. The administrative people came to New Orleans, and they came and visited North. And they looked at it, and they asked the principal, how in the world do you do it with this? You know, and uh, you do it with what you had. You know, what Rumsfeld said, you go to war with the army you got. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason why I asked that question about what did any of you hear about that school is because the bureaucracy was totally unreal. You know. <laughs> There was a gentleman who was in the theater department, but he was uh, an active, an actor, you know, functioning actor. I mean, he was playing a role. And his agent would call from LA and say, hey, Elliot, there's a, there's a movie coming up, and you might like it, so can you come up and read for the movie? He said, yeah, okay. Now, the rule said, if you are going to leave the school for any amount of time. You have to submit in writing two weeks ahead of time. The purpose, the whole thing. Now, I don't know how much you all know about movies and reading for movies. Nobody cares about two weeks or nothing that. You go when you have to go. And the students, there were three theater teachers there. So the students didn't really miss anything by Kena going to Hollywood reading for a movie. And there, uh, there was all, all sorts of things that we were, uh, we were having a faculty meeting at the end of the year. We had 11 faculty, 11, yeah, 11 faculty. And we were discussing the possibility of getting uh, one and a half teachers for the fall. While the meeting is going on, the secretary gets a call from downtown the school board is meeting, and they arbitrarily staff number at five. I mean, you know, just, oh, by the way, we just, you know, y'all got five faculty for next year. Now, if you want to change that or alter that, then you would have to come down now and fight for that. So Tom had to go around <laughs> and do all kinds of stuff with them, you know, just to, to justify what we already had. And there was, uh, you know, there was so much of that. You know, secretary of the school, we call him up one day and told our secretary, we got this kid over here, and he ain't really doing nothing else. So we were thinking, maybe we could send him over there, and he could play around with the arts with you. <laughs> I mean, this is what the kind of stuff that we used to get. You know? So when you look at this, these shows, they got to be on for a while about education. These don't make it. I mean, they, you, they talk about bad teachers, but in most cases, you never really get much of an example of bad teacher. It's going to be on tonight. Brian Williams, and they are interviewing all of these people, and they're talking about education. 
the good teachers and what they did and blah, 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 blah. What actually happens in, in real situations, you don't really get to hear that. Because one of the adversaries in terms of public education is the union. Now, the union is like a double-edged sword. I joined the union, the teachers' union, when it first started. The president was such an impressive person that a lot of the people who had wanted the president of the teachers' union to be the superintendent of school. I mean, he was really good at what he did. And like most people who are really good, their reward, they get kicked upstairs. So that means that the next person, who knows what you get? And when it comes down to it, the plus side of it, there were a lot of benefits that came. Dental, eyeglasses, you know, that kind of stuff. And there was a little less of the parochialism that was going on with the school board before that. Now, on the other side of that, whoever happens to be in a classroom and they have tenure, you know what that is? All right, now, all it takes to get tenure, unless they change, it used to take three years and a day. It's still three years and a day. So if you were actually taught consecutive for three years, and the following year, you went to class and taught that one day, you were tenured. You could be the dumbest person in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that was it. And a lot of people did that. And once they got tenured, they just shipped it in the cruise and headed for retirement, whenever that came. And the more teachers who were ambitious about teaching didn't really stay around. They either went to graduate school and started teaching at the university, or they went. But there used to be a big railroad <coughs> out near the airport on the right hand side, just before you go across the bridge into St. Charles Park. And on the railroad, it said, 40K, stayed away. Texas. They used, uh, between Texas and Georgia, they would come in this system and like they pick up teachers by plucking fruit off of fruit. Because I mean, five thousand dollars a year? I mean we were <laughs> we are nowhere close to that at all. You see? And uh, you talk to any kids who evacuated from Texas. They came back in? About the school that they went to? You remember what they said? <laughs> yeah. You know. But at any rate, uh, I think the best advice I can give you is that. And it's much easier to get forgiveness than permission. <laughs> you know, because otherwise than that. We use that a lot around here. <laughs> we use that a lot around here. <laughs> it's one of the things you taught us. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yes, ma'am. Mr. Marcel, do you have in your mind now, based on everything you've seen and the places you've been, especially when it comes to teaching environment, do you have a model in your mind that you think would, would be a solution? A model? A model, like in your mind, is there an ideal solution for creating the right environment to teach music? You mean in terms of a wish list? Or yes, a reality? A wish. A, wish. <laughs> <laughs> a reality, like if you could create utopia for teaching music, what would you Oh, that, yeah, that's easy. Yeah. <laughs> no, that, that's not a problem at all. <laughs> you know, the, the whole the utopia, you know, every practice room, 
as a piano in everyone. The bigger practice room has two, which means that you have people who are really serious about the piano itself, and the teacher who comes in has two pianos in it. That's just that aspect. The percussion room should be at, at least half the size of this. <laughs> you know, I mean, I've seen them like that at Indiana University in Pennsylvania has a serious inside uh, percussion room. And each faculty, each uh, person on the faculty uh, in music should have the time to deal with the ensemble that they are functioning with. For example, if there's a wind ensemble, now that's a very interesting point, a wind ensemble. Now in most cases, schools will talk about a wind ensemble. They don't really have a wind ensemble. I mean, there's a certain level of instrumentation that you have to have, including several cornets, not just trumpets. In a wind ensemble, there's music that goes with that. So you would need uh, a person who was actually dealing with a wind ensemble. You know, like Huntsbury to do up at Eastland. Mm -hmm. And if you have uh, a jazz studies program, then you have saxophone teachers, trombone teachers, trumpet teachers. You know, this is the, the best of all possible world. You see? And, um, if you can't start out with that, then you need to begin to look for what is commonly referred to as an angel. <laughs> now, the best example of an angel is somebody like Bill Gates. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, that way everybody knows what I'm talking about. But if I say an angel, that's an example of an angel. Now, there are people in this town that could be that. You know, Vincent gave uh, Loyola $8 million. So they got angels out of it. I don't know if I can go give you no $8 million, but you'd have to find it. Anybody, somebody. Yeah. You were talking about how uh, all the troubles with getting no going and I've, I've heard that in the past New Orleans hasn't embraced its uh, the image of jazz being created here or having to do with jazz I wonder if you found that to be true and if, if wait a minute I'm, I'm listening to jazz what I've heard that in the past New Orleans didn't want to uh, embrace the idea that jazz was created here and uh, it seems like the attitude works for business here now, I wonder if uh, city city boards were very uh, proud of the jazz image when you were starting. <laughs> Things of no good. Yeah, well, they wrote a letter and sitting out in 1922, which condemned jazz oh. totally. So as far as that goes, and you know, to the extent to Jazz being created in New Orleans, more than likely, uh, that's a truism. And I think largely because uh, jazz evolved out of folk music, and everybody had folk music, and they all folk music. Not very many indigenous folk musics evolved. You know, I mean, you go back and, and listen to uh, early days of, of some of the country singers, you know, like the Carter fan and, uh, you know, the Blue Ridge Boys. All of, there was a, a whole slew of people that was involved in folk music, but the folk music didn't really evolve into the kind of situation that jazz music evolved into. 
Now, not everybody who was a part of helping it to evolve came from here. You know, but uh, there's a lot about New Orleans and the uh, politicians, the administrators, the school people, in which when you look at it, the musicians that developed here did it in spite of, not because of. You gonna do any playing? <laughs> you gonna do any playing while you're here? You wanna you wanna play with some people? You wanna you wanna do a playing? Or, yeah. or you wanna keep talking? Yeah. Oh mine? Yeah. <laughs> well, we got a lot of other people. I, I can, you, you can't get away. Alright. <laughs> I was uh I was playing at a club. <clears throat> it's no longer this one. On that is the issue how to be a guard. And the club owner, who I thought was really great at actually managing the club, because he made money managing his club, uh, he asked me one day, he said, look, I got an idea, man. He said, why don't you and uh, Steve come and play as a duo? I said, Steve? I said, man, how you gonna make that work? And a guitar. <laughs> I mean, I knew Steve, and there was no doubt that Steve could play. I said, but that, you know, that, that's, you know, that's all in order. He said, man, why don't you try it? And I said, yeah, okay. So the two of us went in one night and stayed two years. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No rehearsal, none of that. <laughs> and we stayed there for two years. And uh, somebody got some tapes in there. <laughs> Talking about the duet days? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Phil DeGree's got all the tapes. Oh, yeah, Phil DeGree. <laughs> Do you have a hair in there, though? Uh, you know, yeah, not lately, but, uh, you know. I know they got they got them floating around out there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I bet they are.
speaker on huh? right now. Oh, yeah. Yeah? <laughs> you don't count. <laughs> yeah, that's hard as silver piece. Competition to type barber. Yeah. It's been a long time. <laughs> oh, it has it. <laughs>
want to hear anybody else play, man? You yeah, like play? always. Anybody want to play a little bass and drums, maybe, or something? <laughs> Sax? Yeah, man, it's been, how long has it been? Oh, two. <laughs> too long. <laughs> too long. <laughs> Yeah, and I was, it was telling them about how we came to do that uh -huh. when Fred suggested it, and that I didn't it. think it was a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> you first reaction is that's like oil and, and water. <laughs> and, we, and we started and with no rehearsal or nothing and stayed there for two years. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's productive time, you know. Yeah, man, that was fun. It seemed like there was always like one major jazz club that was open in any one time, because I mean, it was, before that it was Lou and Charles, right. which is where yeah. I played my first jazz gig, and uh, and then after that, soon after that, it was Tyler's, and Tyler stayed over for many years, and then, uh, you know, what were some of the places you used to play at when you were, uh, you, know, you know? No, you're good, you're good. What about the place you had? Oh. The Haven? What was it called? The Haven? Yeah, that's, the Haven. <laughs> that's a the horror story. <laughs> yeah, that was... Uh, I used to always uh, include that as a description of free enterprise. You know, you hear people talk about free enterprise. Well, in the case of the club that I had, free enterprise was the right to fail. <laughs> <laughs> and believe me, I was in it for about six months and crashed and burned. You know, I found out uh, that I was not a club owner. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I was definitely not a club owner. But that must have been an opportunity to learn on the gig, on the gig like you, you were mentioning before, you know? I mean, you, you learned a lot of stuff playing just on the bandstand with different people. But I didn't learn nothing about business. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the whole thing. I didn't learn nothing about business. At all. You learned you weren't a club owner. <laughs> You know that you know the old joke, right? Huh. How do you make a million dollars? You start with two million dollars and open a jazz club. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yeah. And there it is. Gary, you remember that? Yeah. Yep.
And I was standing by the piano, and I was getting ready to sit down to start the rehearsal. And I mentioned to Harold, I said, man, you know, just about everything that I know about music is right in these two. Right here. And he told me, he got the idea of the silver book after I mentioned that to him. Because, see, Harold's always, always been a very uh, historic-minded person. I mean, with the AFO record label, they have one hit by Bob John and I know. And instead of doing like all the rest of the company, you know, Stax and members of Motown and all that, he says, hey, you guys need to be recorded. So he recorded us, <laughs> uh, the, the quartet, knowing he ain't gonna make no money. <laughs> but uh, for the most part, he said that that was where he got the idea from, to put the silver book together based on the comment that I made about learning music from those particular songs. Because he still has old LPs of like, so I think y'all recorded that. Oh, was it, I think, who was on the album? Oh, it was on the album, I think I had one on it. And he still has his old LPs, like, like he had, I think he had like seven of them. Like, and he was doing like this, I think about five, six of them in there. And it's like, he, he told me, he keeps them for the historical reference of people, you know, yeah, he said that people wants to buy and stuff. He, he told me about all these things he's trying to do and with the music and the fact that not a, a lot of the tunes that uh, were written are not well known. No, I am. Right. So, mm -hmm. and, uh, because nobody was going to play them. So consequently, you know, that's it. <laughs> All right, well, I'm looking at the clock on the wall. <laughs>